The conflict between the Ondo State Governor and his deputy is never ending as the Ondo State House of Assembly has commenced the process of impeachment of the Deputy Governor Agbola Ajayi from office. And in a bid to stop this, the Deputy Governor has filed a suit at the Federal High Court in Abuja to stop the alleged move by the State House of Assembly. Joining us to discuss this is Dakbo Daramola, Public Affairs Analyst. Thank you very much for joining us. I uh, will be joined as well a little later by Mr. Fermi uh, Lawson. He's also a public affairs analyst. But let's start with Mr. Daramola. We understand an impeachment notice has been served on the deputy governor. Now, 26 members make up the assembly. Three members are said to be undecided, and nine have disassociated themselves from the move. Can 14 members impeach the deputy governor? What the Constitution says is that um, two-thirds can sign you know, um, the notice of impeachment and it will be signed by uh, two-thirds of those in the, in the House of Assembly. Now, it's a different subject when it comes to impeachment. Yes, we have seen a lot of, you know, this kind of, um, um, how would I put it now, a lot of uh, miracles happen in Nigerian politics over the years um, since 1999. But I can tell you that, you know, the Constitution is very clear. Um, even if they attempt it, the matter will be returned back because the courts, even to the Supreme Court, have dealt with this matter over and over again. So they don't have the numbers, and they know they do not have the numbers. All right, do um, we have in Mr. Line with the Constitution? The difference between the numbers that can sign the, the you know, notice you know, of impeachment, but not the numbers that can impeach you know, the, the deputy governor. Uh, and um, the issues also must be spelled out, they must be specific. And in all the attempts, you know, what they have put forward also, even before the law, does not hold water. So I do not see how they want to achieve this. Uh, it's a storm in a tick-up, I want to see. Uh, do we have Mr. Lawson? Okay, um, I think he's still not ready, I guess, the network. Uh, let's stay with uh, Mr. Daramola. So the allegation uh, in the impeachment notice, um, there was no details other than gross misconduct. Aside the defection, what else in his recent conduct do you think will qualify as gross misconduct? Again, um, like we know, the, the concept of gross misconduct um, cuts across is a global, uh, we'll be looking for a global definition. You remember during uh, the impeachment of um, uh, Bill Clinton, even as the president of the United States, this issue of gross misconduct came up in his demeanor and uh, it couldn't be defined clearly. And that was why. Um, it didn't fall through at the Senate level. Even when they were going to remove, um, they were going to impeach um, uh, President Donald Trump, that issue came up again. So even in our jurisprudence, you know, even at this level, what does what constitutes justice conduct is not being defined. And according to uh, the, there are about three, ch I mean, charges brought against it um, at the at the assembly level. The first is they said financial recklessness. They said abuse of office. And they said abandonment of his office and also official duties and other assignments. That needs to be answered, of course. He, he will be served and he will answer all of that. And they need to tell him, you know, how all of this constitutes gross misconduct. Secondly, they also define gross misconduct in their own context to mean that his, um, his defection from, you know, the party, APC, to another party in this context now, the People's Democratic Party. How that constitutes, you know, uh, into gross misconduct is another problem that I find it difficult. It won't stand before the law. I wish they understand it. I wish they are, you know, and I'm surprised that, you know, the governor of the state is a senior advocate of Nigeria. I should understand that at this level that we are, even if you go into the case, you know, I think it happened 2014 or 2015, when the super forgot about him, that Abedunde versus on the state house of assembly was a landmark judgment. And there, the, 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 the Supreme Court said that when you talk about, uh, you know, when you go to section 68, okay, that's what they went to contest. Section 68, subsection 1, okay, and then it, it, how do you define that section? And the, it was fully interpreted. But it is not only when there's a problem at the party level within the state, as long as it affects the party even at the national level. That is not, those are not my words. Those are the words of the Supreme Court. 
and we all know that in the last, the man can simply say, in the last couple of months, FPC has been, you know, embroiled in a lot of issues that created division. We, of course, there was a division between the uh, Honorable Victor Giadon faction of the party and also the Oshomole slash late Senator Abel Adjimobi slash, you know, uh, Ilya Il 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 uh, faction of the party. There was a moment of break. There was, a, there was, you know, a break within the party. So the man can quote that. It's as simple as that. So I am so surprised that, you know, the, a, a, a learned man, like a senior advocate of Nigeria, like the sitting governor of, 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 of the state, will allow all this drama to ensue. Except there's an abracadabra. When it comes before the law, as we speak today, the man has not heard, you know, in, in, in law. There's nothing has done wrong. That the defector from a party doesn't mean that, you know, a party that was embroiled in many issues doesn't mean that the man cannot defect. And All right, um, Mr. Daramola, so I, I'm... I'm, 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 I'm I'm, I'm really hoping that um, we can establish connection with Mr. Femi Lawson as well, so we can have um, a still another perspective on the matter. But still staying with you, let's talk about the fact that the Deputy Governor has already dragged the House of Assembly uh, to court in the hopes it will halt the planned impeachment. Is that still relevant now, considering he has been served, or is the impeachment notice invalid? No, it's very relevant. The man took a proactive step. That man it, it seemed to be intelligent. It's very, it, it, I mean, don't forget, as at June 27th, and today we are, this is June 7th, almost 10 days ago, the man already envisaged that this will happen. And even one of the things they, were, they are accusing him of is that, you know, um, one of his aides, who has since been sacked, one particular guy called Okeo, you know, had already, you know, broadcast to everybody. There was a release, you know, that the members of the House of Assembly have been induced financially to gather and then to, to serve, you know, this in people. So whatever, they, they are even lay, they, they're giving credence to whatever argument, you know, is camp brought up before now. Because they said there was an inducement and then the first, you know, order of uh, plenary when the House of Assembly, you know, gathered today, today Tuesday, is to serve the man, you know, it's, I mean, it's to begin the impeachment process. So are you telling me that, you know, there's, no, there's you know, nothing fishy about that? Are you saying the man wasn't right when he, when he preempted that right. there was something about it like this is about to come? Yeah, so I, I seem to keep interjecting. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I, I seem to keep interjecting, but we, we, I just got information that we have Mr. Fermi Lawson joining us, so let's also get him to speak and um, air his opinion on this. Um, Mr. Lawson, can you hear me? Good evening. Yeah, yeah, clearly. Good evening. All right, what's your perspective on what is going on in Ondo State? We know now that the House has um, um, given an impeachment notice to the deputy governor. Um, can 14, I put this question earlier to Mr. Daramola, and I'm putting it to you. Can 14 members of the House indeed impeach a sitting deputy governor? No, I think uh, whatever has to be done in Ondo State has to be done within the dictates of the Constitution, which, of course, clearly stipulates that uh, it requires two-thirds majority of members you know, of the Assembly to carry out an impeachment process against the governor or its deputy. As it is in this case, the state as an Assembly is a, it's a house of 26 members, and it will require not less than 18 members you know, of the Assembly you know, to sign and execute such an impeachment notice. And if uh, one thing is uh, missing here, you know, I listened to a few media reports after that sitting, and, you know, there are claims that not 14, but 20 members had already signed, you know, have already signed the impeachment notice. But I think uh, 14 members, I want to say, cannot uh, impeach the deputy governor the governor of the state is a senior advocate, a former member, and a former president of the Nigerian Bar Association. And I know that he will not also encourage, you know, such illegality. All right, Mr. Lawson, uh, what do you think is likely to play out in the coming days with the seeming escalation of the political situation there? Do you uh, see parties uh, rescinding or uh, some of the actions taking or, like I said, escalation? I think there seems to be no clear attempt at any reconciliation because if you look at what is happening in Ondo State, it's just about you know, individual ambition, you know, 
to occupy positions, not necessarily because of how this, the state is presently governed. That is the most unfortunate aspect of this. And that is why whatever may happen in the next couple of days or weeks in Ondo State may be purely, you know, a product of political gain or loss for, which, you know, for either of the side. But it is important to say that when issues like this arise, you know, the people must always be brought at the center. What has been the position you know, of those who are against the governor today, you know, headed by his deputy, or as far as governance is concerned in this state? No, none of them has actually decided to leave the party for another party because of the performance of the governor or for obvious developmental issues, you know, in this state, but purely because of, you know, non-availability of sharing formula, you know, non non-consideration for some juicy opportunities, just like we have to... An interesting to really position to take. So I think okay. it may not really impact, you know, negatively on the mass of population of the people, you know, than those who are politically, you know, involved in terms of their ambitions. So that means, if, if you're saying it, ha it has nothing really to do with performance, but more of, you know, let me use a local parlance word, sharing the cake and stuff, that means this yes, question yes. I'm going to ask you might be mute. I will ask anyway. Should he step down, as he's been suggested, on a moral ground, since he has, you know, moved his sympathies from the APC to the PDP? Some are saying it will actually gain him some sympathies among the people if he should emerge as the governorship candidate of the PDP. What do you say to this? It, it will not gain him any sympathy. I am from Ondo State and it is a moral burden on him as we speak that is Honorable Agola Ajayi to have, you know, been elected on the platform of a party the All Progressive. I keep saying this, you know, in, in our democracy today, individuals don't stand for elections. It is political parties. The people of Ondo State voted for the All Progressives Congress ticket of Oluwaro Timiakere Dolu, you know, and uh, Mr. Honorable in 2016. But unfortunately, today we have a situation whereby, you know, the person who was on that joint ticket has absconded to another party that was not elected. And today is, you know, is insisting on remaining as the deputy governor despite the fact that the people of Ondo State never elected you know, the PDP into that position. So it's a moral responsibility, and I think it is morally necessary All for right. the deputy governor to quit that position you know, and actually you know, allow you know, sanity, sanity to prevail. All right, Mr. Daramola, I'm coming back to you, and I want to factor the people in in this conversation because most times we just talk about the politics, and we forget that the politics is about is an end is a means to an end to serve the people. My question is, how is this political power play affecting the people um, of that state? In your thinking, do we have Mr. Daramola? Well, I'm always, uh, like I'm always on this program when we have to discuss issues of this. In nature, uh, um, it is never about the people. And so far, I mean, election, electioneering, and also uh, people getting to the public offices or political offices, it's never been about the people. It's about themselves. It's about, the, and that's why this is power play, like um, uh, Mr. Femi Lawson pointed out, you know, um, in his own analysis. It's about, the, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's about themselves. Because if it's about the people, if Governor Ruti Makredulu has done enough, to end, like I said about Basaki the last time, if these people have done enough to end, you know, the, the, the love of the people naturally, based on their performance, nobody needs to begin to worry themselves if I want to stand against them or who doesn't want, you know, but because it becomes a problem because it's never been about governance, it's, about, it's been about politics. I mean, go to any of the states, including on those states. What is the, what is the thing to celebrate about in that state? What has been done in the last four years to, to make people rejoice and want to step out and say, you know, they want to vote the person back, you know? And because everybody is almost the same, whether okay. they go from APC to PDP or PDP back to APC, it's always the same. It's not about governance. All right, Mr. Daramola, we, we are pressed for time. So um, uh, let's give the final floor, I mean, the final take to uh, Mr. Lawson. Mr. Lawson, your final thought on this matter, you can take it from any angle. You have about uh, 40 seconds, if you can. Okay, I think it is an opportunity for the people of Fondo State to actually, you know, look at the situation and actually know 
who is actually interested, you know, more in, in them, you know, more than occupying political positions. It's very unfortunate that people who have been saddled with the responsibility of making life better for the people are more preoccupied, you know, by, you know, the desperation to occupy political positions. And I want right. to repeat the statement of the governor yesterday, which said this dirty politics being played around by people is not worth the life of any single person in the state. I want to say that politicians must not resort to violence, due process must be followed, and people must be peaceful in their thoughts. And I think on a moral ground, Honorable Agualaja, he should quit as the deputy governor of Ondo State. Well, we'll have I to leave it there, Mr. Lawson. PPC, where he has not cross capital to the PDP. Oh, I'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much uh, for joining us in spite of the initial hitches with the network. And of course, uh, Mr. Darambola, always a pleasure to have a conversation with you on this program. Thank you for joining us. All right, we'll take a short break now. And when we return, I'll give my take to stay with us. The All Forgotten's Congress has set up the Edo State Governorship Campaign Council. The chairman of the Convention Planning Committee, Governor Mai Malabuni of Yube State, urged members of the council to work towards ensuring the APC returns in the upcoming September Edo Governorship elections. He also urged Agri Party members to support the reconciliation efforts of the council in order to forge a united and strong party. The assignment before the reconciliation and campaign committees is to build a peaceful and united APC and to ensure successful renewal of the mandate by the good people of Edo State who voted the party into office in 2016. The rich cream of lead ladies and gentlemen carefully appointed into the reconciliation and campaign councils gives the party great hope and confidence that they will succeed for the party to emerge united and victorious. May I use this opportunity to urge you to take advantage of strong teamwork, reach out to all stakeholders and pursue your assignment with all sense of purpose and commitment for the party's success. I also appeal to every stakeholder and members of the party across the country to support the peace initiative of the party for a stronger, united and prosperous APC. I'm glad to state that the caretaker committee, which I am opportune to lead, had initiated a wide range of consultations and reconciliatory measures to pave way for a true and sincere reconciliation. It has also drawn a roadmap and plan of action to forge strong partnership that will stand the test of time among the stakeholders. We are committed to rebuilding confidence and trust, recover the glory and political fortunes of the party in all the states across the country. We must engage in all inclusive consultations to accommodate and fix up areas causing threats to the party. I am happy to state that our visit to some founding fathers of the party last week has justified the new approach with very positive results after the consultations. As chairman and members of the reconciliation committees, you have been carefully selected based on your personal and proven integrity, wealth of experience, and sense of fairness and objectivity to achieve the set target of reconciliation and victory. You should therefore remain focused and committed to succeed to justify the confidence reposed in you. We are working with one voice so that we eliminate the problems of anti-party activities, eliminate the problems of sabotage, eliminate the problems of espionage, so that if there's full reconciliation, then we know that we are working in unison. The council will work with the leadership of the party in the state, so that we understand fully the train, the political train of the state. This will give us the opportunity to know areas of strengths, areas of weaknesses, areas that we have to take advantage, and even areas of threat, we assure you, we will articulate everything possible to ensure that we succeed. Our main objective is to create an enabling environment for all of us to work together, the party men, and even non-party men, members of the public, to ensure that 
we win this very important. I am a bit taken aback by the seeming urgency of the investigation of the now suspended EFCC boss Ibrahim Magu, a man who seems to have many lives, surviving countless attempts to oust him from office since 2015. While there are cries of power tussle depending on whose camp you are on, I see more of a weakness in acting timely by the president. I am not a politician, I am a journalist who makes an effort to keep an eye on developments around the anti-corruption fight. It is from that premise that I speak. Should the ongoing interrogation and investigation by the presidential panel report a guilty verdict, the damage to the reputation of the EFCC and by extension this administration's fight against corruption is grievous. What then? Should he be given a soft landing because of this, or will a transparent investigation and disclosure salvage the battered anti-corruption legacies of this administration? Only time will tell us, and when it does, I will have a humble thought or two to share with you. Until then, we watch. For now, it's a wrap on the program. Thank you for your kind attention while it lasted. It returns same time tomorrow. Remember, you can catch previous episodes on our YouTube channel at Plus TV Africa. Bye for now.